For almost 50 years, Land Rover had been producing rough and rugged machines that could cope with the very worst that anything could throw at them. However, Land Rover realized that they were missing a significant part of the 4x4 market. There were motorists who enjoyed the feel of driving an off-roader, but hardly ever took it off-road. Thus, the Fronteras, the Vitaras, Shoguns of the world appealed to the lifestyle 4x4er, the sort of person for whom a Land Rover seemed a bit too heavyweight and maybe unrefined. Thus was born the Freelander, the ultimate lifestyle Land Rover, appealing to a completely different market to previous models and made with build quality and refinement not seen before. But how does it stack up against the competition? The Carfile team this week take a closer look at the Land Rover Freelander. The new Freelander is aimed very much at the compact 4x4 leisure sector of the market. It's a new area of the market for us and what it will do is bring accessibility for people wanting land, the Land Rover mark and the pedigree that comes with that. What this vehicle is doing is giving accessibility to a lot more people that aspire to Land Rover, to the mark that up until now haven't necessarily been able to afford a Land Rover. Freelander is very much a lifestyle product, but it's, it's just as comfortable off-road as it is on-road. Um, it doesn't have some of the same characteristics, for example, as, as a Discovery, but then it's not specifically aimed at that area of the market. There are two models. One is the, uh, the three-door, um, which has a hardback option or a softback. Um, one of the interesting things about the three-door is the reconfigurability of, uh, of the vehicle. The softback, for example, can be stowed forward onto the header and that combined with the removable um, roof panels gives you a very open, sporty type vehicle. The five-door, on the other hand, is very much a family-orientated vehicle with optimization of interior stowage. When you look at the vehicle, you'll find all sorts of stowage areas at the front of the uh, vehicle in terms of, of stowage bins on the doors, glove boxes, um, stowage areas in the rear quarter panels and at the rear and even up on the on, on the, the headlining with things like the net pockets which are traditional Land Rover cues but sunglass holders all types of very carefully thought out um, detailing. Dynamically it, it's a great car to drive and of course you have this sort of added value of, of sitting relatively high which is very much a Land Rover cue with this authoritative um, command driving position and you see this very nice bonnet in front of you which again is is one of the Land Rover cues and as you walk round the vehicle although it's very contemporary in its design execution you will see there are lots of touches which confirm its 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 pedigree as a as a Land Rover. The interesting thing about Freelander is this unique combination of on-road refinement and on-road dynamics combined with its, its very capable ability off-road. That's a, a unique proposition um, and it, it was de designed very much from the outset as a, a Land Rover product and if you were to compare it with the competition you'll find that most of, the, of that actually is car derived so you don't have the same capabilities. It's very much a car that can be used every day um, on the road and as an everyday vehicle and it's super and I love it and I want to buy one. <laughs> Say the name Land Rover and what images spring to mind? Rugged off-road vehicles that will last a lifetime. They'll get you into and out of most things that you could ever encounter and they're just perfect for the country girl. Most definitely not for the girl around town. Are you with me on this one? Well, a question for you. How do you account for this then.
This is the Land Rover Freelander, Britain's answer to a line of Japanese lifestyle vehicles, a trend started by Toyota's RAV4 and followed up by the Honda CR-V. There are three versions in the Freelander range. There's this, the hardtop, which comes with a three or a five door option. And then a two door convertible Land Rover. A Land Rover to have fun in. There's no doubt you'll look the part in this. After all, it came from the same design team responsible for the MGF. But looks are really only part of the equation. So what's it like on the road? Up here in the cabin, the driving position is really wonderful. You've got this fabulous commanding view of everything that's going on around you. And the whole feeling inside is one of real solidness. Everything's chunky, it's rugged, it feels extremely well built. But don't get me wrong, I have to say, it doesn't feel too boy's own or too macho. It actually, would you believe, has an interior to die for. This is the three-door version and it's just wonderful. There's use of colour, it's nice and bright, there's these gorgeous exposed rivets, nice bits of um, paintwork all over the place. I can't believe it. Land Rover have discovered a designer who realises that the style of a vehicle shouldn't go dramatically downhill the minute you open the door. Given this was going into a sector of the market that Land Rover hadn't been in before, we wanted to create something that was thoroughly contemporary and modern, but at the same time, it had to recognise its heritage through the execution of certain detail cues rather than its overall form. Some of them are obvious, other ones are quite subtle. Things like the castellations in the bonnet, the, the actual clamshell bonnet itself, the very upright nature of the front end, the very equal glass to body relationship, but I think most importantly the overall robustness and solidity that make it unmistakably a Land Rover. So it turns heads when you're off doing the shopping around town, but can it hack it when the going gets tough? Obviously missing here from the inside of the Freelander are those multiple gear levers, you know, the low gear ratio set that you expect to find in a Land Rover. In this, you're left to the mercy of electronic traction control. And believe me, it works absolutely wonderfully. It's astounding what this thing can do. And on the way down, well, you need to get your vehicle fitted with the optional hill descent control. It comes in at just under a thousand pounds. All you do is hook this down, engage hill descent control, and you let the anti-lock brakes do the job for you. Here goes. Fingers crossed. Feet completely off the pedals. All you need to do is steer. And it's amazing. It works. Thank goodness for that. What it's doing is keeping the speed at a constant 5.9 miles per hour. It works out what kind of bumps and jolts you're going over and compensates for all that. I don't know how it does it, but it's incredibly clever. The Freelander has so far been a great success story for Land Rover ever since it was introduced a year ago. But whilst most people go on about attractive packaging and value for money, it was a particular piece of technology of almost anorak proportions that stood out for me. It's called HDC, or Hill Descent Control, and I've come to Rover to find out exactly what it means and how it works. Right, so what have we got here? Okay, well this is underneath of a Range Rover, which is uh, one of our main product lines at Land Rover. And it, the drive line here is laid out in a fairly conventional four-wheel drive fashion. We're starting up here with the, with the engine, but it runs along the length of the vehicle, what we call north-south, which is all up under here. Underneath this cover here is the transmission, the main gearbox. Mm -hmm. And on the back of it, is the unit that we're talking about today, which is the transfer box. Right, now remind us what that does. Okay, the transfer box takes the drive out of the gearbox, which is the thing that gives you your one, two, three, four, five normal uh, gear, gear ratios, 
puts it into here. First thing it does is split it to put the drive to the front axle and the drive to the rear, which gives you a four-wheel drive. The second thing it does is generate two sets of ratios. So you've got a set of high gears for on-road use and a set of low gears for off-road use. Ah, quite a difference. Mm, well, it, there's very little here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a different application in terms of technology for a very different sort of customer. As I've described to you, we're looking for very simple uh -huh. um, four-wheel drive controls, and that's what this vehicle offers. Um, first of all, very different in that the engine is placed like a front-wheel drive car. It's across the vehicle, what we call east-west. And the gearbox is mounted on the side, and off the back of that is the equivalent of the transfer case. We call it the intermediate reduction drive. And that's basically, it does the same job of splitting the drive, in which case now it goes to the front wheels directly, like a front wheel drive car, and it splits the drive down the prop shaft here to the rear. Right, okay. let's have a look. And straight away, obvious difference to the Range Rover, no second gear shift. That's right, and this is, this is the uh, what the customer sees as the, the end result of all of that technology under the bonnet. Just the simple yellow button on the gear stick. So how do you actually use it? Okay, so um, say you're at the top of a very steep slope, put it into first gear, slide the collar down and you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Just let the vehicle go, no need to put your feet on any of the pedals. The vehicle will just look after you. So it's just one one touch operation, really. That's right. And going uphill, you just use uh, first gear as normal. Would you? you would, yes. And we'd, we'd advise customers to keep it in uh, hill descent control because you can drive through it. Mm. So the moment you put your foot on the throttle, it'll um, instantly cancel the, the operation out. And when you take your foot back off the throttle, it'll come back in again. It's just really completely emulating the um, low gear braking that you'd get from a, from a dual range transmission. This grinding sound that you can hear is the hill descent control just firing into action. Apparently there's been some complaints from some of the um, dealers that have driven this vehicle that they found it a bit irritating and annoying. Personally, I really like it. It reminds me that the technology is there and that it's working for me. And in situations like this, that's an awfully big relief. All the technology that's fitted to the Freelander is necessary in a situation like this. It just couldn't cope with it all without it. But if all you're going to do is drive the vehicle around town and maybe up a few country lanes, I suppose you could say, well, why do we need it? I mean, 95% of people that buy off-road vehicles never take them off-road. But what you've got to do is look at the bigger picture. If it's made to withstand and to cope with these kind of conditions, it means that it's going to be extremely well built, it's going to last longer, and it's also going to be a lot safer in everyday situations. You know, I don't remember attacking mountains like this in the Honda CRV. Still, if you want to have a shower when you're at the beach, then I suppose it would be very useful for that. A real shower. Oh, I'm having so much fun today. The Freelander has a multitude of accessories, body kit and styling extras, so you can personalise it to suit your taste. There's over 200 in total, all designed by Land Rover themselves, which is quite unique. The standard kit, however, is a bit miserly, but there are a couple of rather nice touches. Like this one, a remote control button, opens the rear window perfect for when you're shopping maybe you're hemmed in and you need to get that bag in the back of the car and then a nice added safety feature is that it will only close again with the key so you have total control over it no danger of getting the children's fingers trapped in that and how about this for space in the back there are estates on the market today that can only dream about having this much room now this is a three door and it comes as standard with these two individual seats the five door has three seats, but you can get them as an option on this if you've got a few children that you need to carry around with you. And speaking of children, on those long journeys when they're bored and driving you absolutely mad, this will come in handy. A PowerPoint, they can plug in their games, and there, you won't hear a peep out of them for hours. Peace and quiet, wonderful. 
and just see how easily the rear seats fold down, giving you even more room. Look, even I could do it, first time. After the break on Carfile, why Freelander won What Cars Car of the Year award and also living day to day with the vehicle. Join us after the break. Out of all the winners, there could be but one Car of the Year. There could only be one Car of the Year and that had to be the Land Rover Freelander. Um, I think a, a lot of the credit must go to its looks. It's a little bit military in a way, um, but it's, it's very appealing. You want to get in it, in it and drive it. And when you do, you find that Land Rover have pulled an even cleverer trick um, because it's very smooth on the road and very easy to manoeuvre. There isn't the usual thing you have with 4x4s of, of them being big trucks, which are tough to take around city streets. Um, this thing is light and nimble on its feet. I think it's got to be a, a big congratulations to Land Rover uh, for winning the Watt Car Car of the Year for 1998. They really deserve it. I would like them all to know this is only just the beginning of a whole new era for Land Rover and the beautiful Rover. This is the Land Rover Freelander. This is the rather sensible five-door station wagon, but there's also a particularly gorgeous three-door version that comes with a removable hardtop, or would you believe a convertible option? Under the bonnet, you can choose from a 2-litre diesel that's used in the Rover 6 and 800 or this 1.8-litre petrol that you'll find powering the MGF. And once you've decided whether to go for the 3 or the 5 door, whether you want the soft or the hard top, you've chosen the engine you want and you've picked one of the 14 colours or 14 interiors then your problems have only just begun. Accessorise. You know how accessories finish off the look so well. Well, Land Rover have produced over 100 extra items specially designed for Freelander, so you can personalise it to suit your own tastes. A kind of expensive Meccano kit for grown-up boys and girls. Once your decision is made, even if you decide just to go for the basic model, the Freelander really does turn heads. And it's not just out of curiosity to see what Land Rover's new baby looks like. It stands out on the road for all the right reasons. It's macho looking with bulges in all the right places, but it's not too large or bulky looking. In fact, it's actually deceptively small because the Discovery really isn't that much larger. Although it's an all-new vehicle, you know instantly what family the Freelander is from. And just in case you're in any doubt about this vehicle's heritage, then there are plenty of logos around to remind you. Once inside the Freelander, you get a very pleasant surprise. You're greeted by something that seems to have been designed instead of stuck in as a bit of an afterthought. The Freelander design team have obviously realised that us drivers actually spend more time looking at the interior of a vehicle than we do the exterior. But my advice if you're looking to make a real style statement is to go for the Freelander three-door. It has a wonderful interior. Exposed rivets and colour-coded paintwork everywhere. Very industrial, very 90s. Practicality hasn't been forgotten either. There are cubby holes, map nets and pockets everywhere. There's even a lockable hidey hole under the floor in the back, and there's also a power socket. Both driver and passengers have plenty of room, and although the boot isn't huge, folding down the split rear seats is an absolute breeze. See, nothing to it, and it gives you loads more space. One very useful feature is the electronically operated window on the tailgate. What will they think of next? So it's practical, and I'm sure you'll agree it's perfect for posing in. But let's get back to performance.
The first thing you notice is that the Freelander really does feel like a car. You could easily be in the Rover 600, but that's not a bad thing. What it means is that you instantly feel at home behind the wheel. Everything feels familiar, you're just a bit higher up than normal. Around town the visibility really is excellent and the power steering makes it extremely easy to park. Out on the open road it feels solid. It's a comfortable ride rather than a sporty ride because of the softer suspension. But the steering is direct and there's just a hint of body roll on these country roads. The performance you'll get from this 1.8 litre petrol engine isn't going to set you on fire. But having said that, it is quite lively. Drive the Freelander in a relaxed, easy-going way, and it won't disappoint you. Oh, I nearly forgot. What about the rough stuff? As they say, here's one I made earlier. As you can see, Daddy Discovery can be very proud of baby Freelander's off-road prowess. Particularly if you get a little optional extra fitted, Hill Descent Control. A clever little device that when engaged controls the anti-lock brakes, limiting your speed to 5.6 miles per hour. And if it senses a particularly nasty bit coming up, that speed slows down even more to 4.4 miles per hour. This clever gizmo, together with electronic traction control, a tail shaft with a viscous coupling and front and rear diffs with slightly different gearing mean that if you want to go mud plugging, the Freelander will be well up for it. Freelander is a lifestyle vehicle, uh, but it is a true Land Rover as well. Two of the areas where we pay particular attention to whilst we're developing Freelander was its on-road capability, its on-road performance, its leisure style and its impact on the, on the customer. But also very, very important for us as well was the Land Rover heritage, uh, the credibility of the Land Rover mark and the off-road prowess of the vehicle. The vehicle is very, very different from previous Land Rovers in lots of respects. Um, the body in white is a unitary construction design. We haven't got uh, beam axles on the vehicle at all. It doesn't carry a low ratio box. But the way we've uh, applied new technologies to the vehicle and adapted the systems um, gives us all of the off-road capabilities that we look for in a true Land Rover product. We've, we've captured the essence of what we tried to deliver when we were uh, working on the concept of the vehicle and it, it almost looks like a classic in, even before it's got launched. Um, I think it's got tremendous longevity as a product. 